should follow on on this case at approximately six months after completion of induction. He's undergoing routine surveillance imaging and is found to have a recurrence of lymphadenopathy. In regards to the size, the mesenteric and axillary nodes are increasing, suggestive of disease progression. This is a patient that we consider to be poor risk given the fact that he had a very short duration of response following completion of induction. In follow-up for our case vignette, this patient is returning at six months for routine follow-up. On surveillance imaging, he's found to have increasing size of lymph nodes in both the mesenteric region and the axilla. A biopsy is pursued, confirming relapsed follicular lymphoma with no evidence of histologic transformation. I think this is a very important point. Oftentimes, patients who relapse early, there is concern that they have underlying large cell lymphoma transformation that is driving those short remission duration. I think it's very valuable to biopsy these patients for two reasons. One, to ensure that you know which type of lymphoma you're dealing with. And secondly, before you commit them to more therapy or sometimes more intensive therapy, to be certain that this is actually representative of lymphoma. Though rarely, occasionally, we will biopsy patients and find underlying granulomatous um, inflammation or other sources of lymph node enlargement. I don't biopsy patients at every relapse, but I think the first relapse, particularly if it's a short duration of response, warrants histologic confirmation that you are dealing with follicular lymphoma. We can also go back and criticize why did this patient not receive maintenance rituximab? That's something that's commonly done, particularly following RCHOP, based off of the PRIMA study. I think this is still a discussion to be had between a physician and the patient. What I, how I handle that discussion is that we know maintenance rituximab will lead to an improvement in progression-free survival, but no difference in overall survival. And I have found there are patients that would prefer not to be in the physician's office and would prefer to have their time and forego the maintenance, understanding that they may have a shorter remission period. I've also had patients that are concerned about when that first relapse will happen and are very satisfied with undergoing maintenance rituximab if there's any chance that that first remission will be delayed or will be prolonged. We've also learned recently from the Casulo paper, which was a retrospective analysis of the National InfoCare study, that patients who relapse early, which is defined as within 24 months of their diagnosis, most of whom received RCHOP therapy, have an inferior overall survival. So again, this identifies a high-risk population. And there's been observations across prospective studies, including the PRIMA study, that about 20% of patients will relapse within 24 months, independent of whether or not they receive maintenance. So I still feel it is valuable for some patients to receive maintenance for tuximab or CD20 antibody, particularly if you would like to prolong their first remission period but it is unlikely to reduce the chance of that early relapse from occurring. The other criticism of the Casulo paper is that there was not routine histologic confirmation that those were actually relapsed follicular lymphoma and how many of those patients actually had a transformation that were driving those inferior outcomes. Nonetheless, an early relapse we consider to be a high-risk patient and one that should be thought of differently given their overall survival or median overall survival is anticipated to be only five years, whereas the counterpart to that, those that relapse beyond 24 months, their median overall survival is expected to be the same as their age sex match cohort. So as described by a colleague, um, they're just as likely to make it to their 20-year high school reunion as their classmates. So how will we manage this patient with an early relapse? That's currently an unknown meaning there are studies that are being designed to address what is the most appropriate management for an early relapse follicular lymphoma. But there are prospective studies to guide us in terms of management. The most recent study to be reported is the Gadolin study, which enrolled patients who were relapsed refractory to rituximab, meaning they had progressed or failed to respond within six months of their last course of rituximab, which, would have fed the, which this patient would have met those eligibility criteria. That study was a randomized trial investigating obinutuzumab plus bendamustine versus bendamustine monotherapy, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. The patients on the arm that contained obinutuzumab also went on to receive maintenance obinutuzumab. This was a positive study, meaning the study met its primary endpoint of improvement in PFS if patients received obinutuzumab plus bendamustine, suggesting that you can overcome rituximab resistance with a next-generation CD20 antibody. So bendamustine is a reasonable option for this patient. 
There is also questions emerging as to whether or not chemotherapy is the preferred approach to a patient who relapses within six months of their last chemotherapy containing regimen. Again, this is currently investigational. There are a number of agents that are emerging, such as immune modulators or targeted agents, and we can talk about some of the recent data um, surrounding idelalisib, which is reserved for patients who have failed at least two lines of therapy, including a chemotherapy and a CD20 antibody. I think transformation is something that should always be considered in a patient who is failing to respond as we would traditionally expect, meaning they have a progression event that's occurring within a short period of time. I, in regards to how should you work up a concern for transformation, I think it is reasonable to pursue a core needle biopsy if that's the most efficient and convenient approach for patients. We are not routinely pursuing excisional biopsies at that time point. I think excisional biopsies are still incredibly helpful, and if the morbidity is worthwhile, it should be considered, but we're relying heavily on core needle biopsies in that setting.